Hello, everyone, and welcome to Gun Violence Prevention Through the Public Health Lens, History, Intersectionality, and Interventions. I'm Mighty Fine. I'm the Director of Public Health Practice and Professional Development at the American Public Health Association, and I will be serving as your moderator today. As noted in the title, very straightforward, that's what we'll be talking about. Our speakers today will talk, lead us through conversations on uh, the history of gun violence in America, intersectionality and intervention. So what's working, what are we doing and what can we be doing differently? I have the pleasure of having with me today, uh, Dr. Linda DeGudis, who is a professor at Yale School of Public Health, go Bulldogs, <laughs> and also an adjunct professor at Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. She's a, a notable consultant in injury and violence prevention and comes with a wealth of knowledge and expertise. Followed by her will be Dr. Howard Spivak, who is a former principal deputy director of the National Institute of Justice of the US Department of Justice, former director of the Division of Violence Prevention at the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the CDC. So a bit of a mouthful there. <laughs> Following Dr. Spivak, we'll have Ms. Mishka Mitchell, who is the vice president of Camden Community Partnership, Go Jersey. <laughs> and closing us out is Dr. Joseph Richardson, who is a professor of African American Studies and Medical Anthropology at the University of Maryland, lead, and also a lead epidemiologist for the Center for Injury Prevention and Policy uh, Violence Intervention Programs at the University of Maryland Medical Systems. So our uh, all of our panelists today are very well steeped in this space. And so we are privileged to have them to uh, elevate this conversation with us today. Uh, for those of you who follow the American Public Health Association, you know gun violence prevention is something that's very near and dear to the work that we do. We recognize that there is a singular cause for gun violence prevention or violence prevention more broadly. And we recognize in the same way that there's not a singular solution. So what our anticipation today is to really elevate the conversation, to bring this collectiveness to the issue, recognizing that we're not going to arrest our way out of this. We also recognize that we need to engage with other sectors. It's not owned by public health. Certainly public health principles, philosophies, and ideologies have moved this work forward, but we recognize that we also have to pull from other spaces and again, have a collectiveness to the work that we're doing in order to see true change in one of the leading causes of premature death. Uh, it's an issue that's very near and dear to my heart personally and professionally, and I can talk to you all for hours about it, but it's not about me today. So with that, I'll um, just welcome you all today and uh, remind you that we'll be taking questions and answers towards the end of the program. So be sure to put your questions in the question chat function, and if it applies to a particular person, be sure to include their name and your question so we can be sure to uh, ask that question to that uh, individual. So without further ado, Dr. Dagudis, I'm gonna turn it over to you to get us started today. Great, um, thanks Mighty, and thanks to all of you who are attending and all to the other panelists. Um, we're very happy that we can talk with you about this today and tell you a little bit about how we're all thinking of and using the public health approach to gun violence prevention. Um, as Mighty mentioned, we have um, a book that APHA has recently published that um, Dr. Spivak and I have co-edited, and it really focuses on what are the public health strategies that we can use to prevent gun violence and how can we do it effectively. Um, it's intended to serve as both a primer and a handbook for people who are practitioners, um, policy makers, advocates, students, the public, and we're really trying to make the information about the public health approach accessible. Um, we know that gun violence is a component of the entire spectrum of violence, and it is not just about the guns, but it is the fact that people are violent. Um, so we need to do something about it. We need to look at how public health has addressed other issues successfully. And that's what we've focused on with the book. And that's what you'll hear more about in this webinar. So we're not talking about taking all the guns away. We're talking about creating an environment in which we can be safe, given that there are guns present, just like we work to have an environment where people are safer because you know, we have cars and trucks that pose risks, but 
um, we've managed to do a great deal to decrease those risks. And what the book is about is what we can do right now. Um, we know that firearm deaths currently are a major problem and a major public health problem with over 30,000 people killed every year and millions of others who are injured. We know that there are mass killings, which are a small portion of the problem, but very um, dramatic and certainly a serious issue. And we also know that suicide is one of the major issues with respect to gun violence. Um, we also want to say that the principles that we used in putting this book together and putting the information together is that while mental health, including substance use, um, could be a contributing factor in some of the gun related deaths, it's not the only issue. And it's really a minority of people with mental health diseases who are violent they're usually victims of violence as opposed to being those who are perpetrating violence. So we don't wanna make it all about mental health. We also know that there is research available that can help us understand what can work to prevent gun-related deaths and injuries. And there are examples from other places around the world about how this has happened. Um, we have our own research here in the US and a number of researchers who have focused their entire careers on looking at what we can do to prevent um, gun violence. And the other thing we know is that language is extremely important, that we don't use the terms gun control, we use the term gun safety instead. Because the minute we use a term like gun control, we turn off the discussion and the ability to have a real dialogue about it. So we really want to focus on some of those things, we want to um, really focus on the need to have science to inform action, but also the need to make sure that programs are evaluated to make sure that they're working and modified if they need to be. And we really want to work to change the dialogue so we can all work together to identify how to keep people safe, given that we have firearms in our environment. We know that firearm violence is a public health crisis and a serious public health issue and it really calls for a public health solution. So listen, ask questions, and um, really uh, help us to work towards eliminating firearm violence. Thank you. Mighty. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Degus. appreciate that um, for setting the stage for us today. As an extra bonus or incentive for today, I wanted to let you all know that we will be sharing the link for that book. And for those of you who are tuned in today, we are offering a 10% discount on that purchase through the uh, through August 20th. So be sure to use the code GVP. We'll be sure to put it in the chat as well for your reference, but um, that's just an uh, extra special bonus for you all being with us today. Uh, Dr. Spivak, uh, open it up for you now to, to tell us about the US landscape and the history of gun, gun violence in the country. Thank you, Mighty, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, while most people familiar with this issue of, of firearm violence are aware of this, it's always worth repeating that um, uh, the United States stands out when compared to other um, affluent industrial nations in the world as having um, an exceptionally high rate of homicide. Um, uh, it's, in the last quarter of the 20th century, uh, there was a steady increase in homicides in the United States. Uh, and uh, this peaked in the early to mid 1990s when the rates were extremely high. After which, um, in part due to a lot of public health efforts, um, we have seen a steady decline in homicides across this country in all areas, in cities, in smaller cities, um, in rural areas. Um, however, over the last year and a half or so, that picture has begun to dramatically change. In 2020, there was approximately a 25% increase in homicides in this country. Um, um, and this occurred across a number of different uh, boundaries, uh, big and small cities, um, it was pretty substantial. Um, and in the first half of 2021, the increases seem to be continuing. Um, and there's been about a, 
10 to 15 percent increase over the first half of 2021. Um, what's important to understand is that while the homicide rates have increased substantially, um, crime rates have not increased. And in fact, uh, rates of robberies have fallen 10 percent, rates of property crime have fallen almost 8 percent, rates of rape or reported rapes have decreased by 14 percent, and in fact all violent crimes have only increased by 3 percent as compared to the 25 plus percent that we've seen in the rise in rates and homicides. So it seems to be very specific to homicides and in particular gun-related homicides. It's also important to note that while these increases have been occurring, um, the rates are still not where they were in the early to mid 1990s. There are some cities like Philadelphia and St. Louis that have seen increases that have brought them back to the rates they experienced then. But many other places like Chicago, New York and LA, while they've seen increased uh, rates in homicides, um, they are still not even close to where they were in the mid 1990s. So the situation is not looking good, but hopefully will not reach the levels of crisis that they uh, that existed um, before the turn of the century. Um, a couple of things about the homicides and the increase that we've been seeing. One is that um, while there are a number of very high profile mass homicides that have occurred, the primary contributing factor to the rise in rates is not these mass homicides, but in fact are the day-to-day um, -day homicides that are occurring in communities. And as has been true in the past, the communities that have been most affected by this rise in rates have been communities of color. Um, and so it is particularly distressing to see that happening once again, um, there appears to be some relationship between this more recent rise um, and the pandemic that's occurred, although the rates were rising before the shutdowns in uh, March and April of 2020. So um, this somewhat precedes the more severe parts of the pandemic, but there does seem to be a relationship. Um, how? this relationship or what this relationship means is unclear. It may be related in part to the stresses that have occurred as a result of the pandemic. There's been a substantial increase in, um, in um, uh, gun purchasing um, during the pandemic. And that may be in part contributing to the rise that we're seeing as well. Um, so there's, uh, a considerable cause for concern that's um, calling for some real action at this point. Um, I just wanna speak a minute or two about uh, what may have contributed to the decline in um, homicides um, since the late uh, 20th century. And it appears that this may be related to a number of things from some national effort, level efforts around um, uh, the implementation of background checks and a variety of other things, but this may also substantially be related to the uh, fact that there's been a, a considerable increase in local community-based initiatives to reduce violence and reduce um, gun violence in particular. Um, and one of the concerns has been that the pandemic has caused some of these programs to either uh, shut down or um, reduce in their efforts. Um, and that may be part of the, the, the elements that are contributing to the rise that we're seeing now. Um, I think at this point, I will end my brief comments um, as we'll move on to some discussions about community level efforts. So back to you, Mighty. Thanks, Dr. Spivak, for setting us up um, that way. So I'm going to turn it over now to Ms. Mitchell to talk to us about some of the community-led efforts that she is organizing in New Jersey. Thank you, Mighty. Um, my name is Mishka Mitchell. I'm Vice President at Camden Community Partnership in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, from this picture, you can see we are located directly across from the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we share the Delaware River with them, and so 
what we have that they don't have that you can see in this photo is a view of Philadelphia. Uh, we are a small city with big problems and, you know, but from a historic past and, you know, from a place that was the home of the talking machine. So the RCA Victor, the Victrola was invented in Camden. Next slide. Uh, Walt Whitman found his home in Camden for a while and Campbell Soup still finds uh, the city home today. But from, you know, its heyday in 1957, to, you know, like many uh, Northeast and former industrial cities with the closing of the factories, uh, the exodus to the suburbs, uh, structural racism really has changed the tide for our city. And Camden has been on all the lists in the country that no one wants to be on. So we've been on the poorest and the most violent. Um, although, you know, today there is definitely a turnaround and things are happening here. But when we think about um, interventions and thinking about how to change the tie for gun violence and violence in general in Camden, you know, there, there are the traditional methods. And so certainly I have to give, you know, credit um, our Camden Police Department actually did a complete restructuring in 2013 um, and has been a national model for community policing. Um, now they've, you know, pinned the coin for unity policing. Uh, there's many uh, intervention methods and youth uh, programs that have also been a part of the story. But um, as a planner, um, the work that we've been doing has been around interventions on the public realm and arts and culture and what those impacts do. So, you know, when we look at this picture, you see the density that was Camden in 1957. And go to the next slide. Uh, today you have neighborhoods, and this is the North Camden neighborhood, and what you see in the map and all of these gray spots um, are either vacant land and vacant building, where you have neighborhoods um, that were once, you know, fully dense, every single block was built up to its full capacity, where you now have, you know, 20, excuse me, 28% of a neighborhood being vacant land and you know, 12 acres of vacant buildings within one neighborhood. And what we know is that when you have vacant buildings and vacant land, um, you know, what ends up being centered around these places is um, the opportunity for crime to happen. And how can we on the structural level as planners and interventionists begin to think about how to tackle that? And I know many cities have done vacant lot stabilization. Uh, we are right across from Philadelphia, which really has been a model for vacant lot stabilization um, around the country. You know, when we think about, you know, the clean and green, cleaning up a vacant lot and greening it with a, and putting up a fence and a split rail, those things happen a lot. But what else can be done as we're thinking about how to build these communities back up and, and stem the tide for the crime that's happening? Next slide. What we were also seeing in Camden is that along with those vacant lots, that vacancy was also spilling over to, um, go back a slide, um, was spilling over into the parks and the open spaces in the city. And as we begin to reclaim those, um, you know, we started to think about how we can begin to activate those spaces. So it was both in the transformation of vacant spaces to active spaces. So if you look at the, you know, the bottom right hand corner where we built a, a community build for a skateboard park in a vacant lot or uh, sort of a mini golf course, which is in the bottom left hand corner on another vacant lot in this neighborhood. But also thinking about the parks and open spaces that, be, that have become havens for illicit activity and gun violence that we began to populate those and make those become the community centers that they needed to be. Um, putting in festivals and yoga classes and other activities with arts and culture with the community at the center. And, you know, I know sometimes people think uh, arts and culture activities are frivolous, um, but I know that arts and culture can be the glue that holds the community together, um, but also it humanizes neighborhoods. When we are in these urban centers and we think that they are not deserving of a festival or they have too many problems to think about a fitness class in a park, you know, that takes away the humanity of the people that live there. And that also begins to sort of help to keep that 
circle going of community violence. Next slide. Where we have vacancy in Camden, you have illegal dumping. And in Camden, when we're talking about illegal dumping, generally we're, this is 75% of dumping that happens from people that are outside of the city coming into the city and dropping off truckloads of construction debris or mattresses, or you know, even right now we're fighting a case of uh, illegally dumped soil. Um, anything that people don't wanna pay a tipping fee to properly dispose of. And in these vacant spaces where you then have illegal dumping, you sort of you know continue that trend of having the intersection for crime and vacancy. Next slide. You know what you see in these the two maps that you have is that there's a map of some of the illegal dumping hotspots in the city, um, as well as sort of the hotspots for crime. And what you see is there's direct overlap for where these locations are. Where there's more illegal dumping, there's more vacancy, and there's more crime. And how can we begin to think about how can we tackle this as an issue? You know, it's something that leads to crime, but it's also for Camden, a place that has a structural deficit and, and very small resources. Um, cleaning up other people's waste costs the city of Camden over $4 million a year. So like there's no small feat, you know, the and the environmental impacts above that. So these are all things that really continue the blight of a neighborhood and lead to additional crime. For Camden, uh, you know, thanks to a Bloomberg Philanthropies grant, we actually came up with a very creative solution to think about how to tackle illegal dumping in Camden. Next slide. Through a program um, and a project called A New View Camden, uh, right now we have six different sites that used to look like this. So former illegal dumping sites. Uh, we chose specific sites that were on highly trafficked corridors. This is a corridor for the high speed line that travels from the South Jersey suburbs over to Philadelphia called the PACO. And what we did was do large scale public art interventions on these lots. So not only did we transform the spaces and get rid of the illegal dumping, We've got rid of the crime that was happening at these locations and turned them into centers of activity around a public art piece. So this is what this site looks like today. Next slide. There's a beautiful installation called Invincible Cat um, by two artists, Don Cannell and Lisa Adler. Um, the illegal dumping on this site has been eradicated, but all of the art installations that have been installed all um, harken back to thinking about new ways um, to tackle waste. So this, um, this piece is made from recycled car hoods. Um, it, we have other pieces like a, 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 a 15 foot tall standing robot um, that is picking up trash, or we have another installation that takes uh, styrofoam and has mealworms that digest the styrofoam as sort of a STEM project that shows how you can tackle waste with what's happening. Next slide. Here's another example. And this sort of shows sort of all of the interventions that can happen about what we do. And sort of, you know, you see the split rail fence that's happening there. That's a traditional um, sort of vacant lot stabilization technique where you clean up of what was a vacant lot and you put a fence up to show that it's cared for. Um, sometimes that works and sometimes people are still dumping. So they're dumping, they were still dumping in the rear of this lot. Um, and so we transformed this lot also through the New View project into a community space called Touching the Earth. Next slide. Um, that has, you know, a, a clay oven, a clay bread oven, and now is a community gathering site. Um, the mural at the top was done. We hired uh, 10 so in, in, a, in addition to the national artists that were hired as a part of this project, we had an artist apprenticeship program where we were training Camden residents to be the, the next phase of uh, artists to do uh, our next set of public art. So one of our apprentices did this mural that you see um, that's at the rear of this site here. And these sites are also used for different types of programming whether it's bringing awareness to illegal dumping, like a community forum that was held here,
or a, a, a community movie night where you can get the community together in a space and be able to make those connections. Um, you know, when we are thinking about um, being and in, in sort of intervening in how to stem the time for community violence, for us, it's about bringing back the term for community. And, you know, it's that you shouldn't have to go outside of your neighborhood to look for something fun to do. It's about bringing back that livability. It's about bringing back all of those things that make people want to stay in a neighborhood and bringing back some vibrancy. So when, you know, people think about, you know, the fact that, you know, movie nights are something that, you know, we shouldn't be thinking about. Um, I say those are the exact things we should be thinking about. If we want our youth to be out of trouble, we need to provide them with things to do. And while all of the other interventions and, you know, working with, you know, the police or youth programs and curfew programs are also important and we partner with those entities as well, you know, I think it's important for communities to remember that arts and culture really become something that can be a cornerstone for not only the creation of community and livability, but also for stemming violence in your communities. Next slide. So I'm happy to share a little bit of our story with you. You could find more about Connect the Lots, which is our activation program for our open space at ctlcamden.com and about our public art intervention at A New View Camden. And we're happy to answer your questions later on in this presentation. So thank you. And I'll turn this back over to Mighty. Thank you so much, Ms. Mitchell. And there are questions certainly pouring in for you. So I'll be sure to elevate that during the Q&A period. Having spent some time in Camden when I lived in Jersey, it was uh, really uh, thrilling to see what's happening there. Uh, so last but certainly not least, but I'm going to bring up Dr. Richardson to close us off for this didactic portion. Then I'll bring the panelists back on to talk about the way to move forward. Then we'll get into questions that you all are posing in the audience. So feel free to continue to uh, note those in the Q&A feature on the Zoom webinar. Thank you, Mighty. Uh, good afternoon. Again, my name is Joseph Richardson, uh, professor at the University of Maryland College Park, but I'm also um, the co-founder and co-director of a hospital violence intervention program at the University of Maryland, uh, Prince George's Hos County Hospital Center, which I directed from 2017 to 2019. So much of my uh, presentation will focus on the young men who I worked with who, who were survivors of violent firearm injury who were treated um, at that hospital and were participants in the program. Uh, next slide. So in terms of intersectionality, which you know I define as the intersection of race, gender, age, social class, as well as sexual and gender identity, um, how do these layers of identity contribute to health outcomes? And so uh, since much of my work focuses on young men from the District of Columbia, I think it's important to, uh, to, use, to use these young men in their lives to frame this conversation around health outcomes as it relates to um, violent firearm injuries. And so here is a, a, a clip uh, from, a, from the Washington Post in terms of the life expectancy of young Black men in the nation's capital who are expected to die 17 years or earlier um, and have lower life expectancies um, in the district. Next slide. So we know that gun violence is the leading cause of death for young black men between the ages of 20 and 39 and has persistently been um, the leading cause of death for that age group for years. And so here, oh, uh, over half of gun homicide victims are black men. Um, and make up 52% of all gun, gun homicides, but represent less than 7% of the population. Next slide. Um, I created a digital storytelling project, which I am the executive producer of, which focuses on the lives of 10 young black men who have been violently injured. Um, they're all from the District of Columbia and their narratives expressing the ways that they experience traumatic stress. And many of the symptoms that they experience are similar to uh, the symptoms that you would find among soldiers who were in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria. 
And we also interviewed the therapists, trauma surgeons, as well as the this many significant people that are involved in their lives, their caregivers, um, et cetera. So this is a, a clip, if you could just press play. This is a clip of, you can go back and hit play um, on that, just down at the bottom. I pull up to the end of the parking lot, get the spray 56 times. We thought it was fireworks. It wasn't. And we started hearing them break the shade off the wall. It was real. I didn't know I was shot until I got around the corner. Felt a cramp. Then my hand got real hot because of the blood. I looked down, I got shot. I passed out about two, three times. Ambulance came to the hospital. Got out the next day. It was wartime. I'd say for the guys that we work with, um, hypervigilance is the main symptom. And hypervigilance is the feeling of, I'm not safe. I just moved into my own little spot. I hear little noises. I be thinking it's something else, a whole nother ball game. I'm way out my own. By the time I get halfway through the hallway, I be like, man, lay your ass back down. Like real life, man. I'm getting used to it, man. I'm get, I gotta get back used to being comfortable. That's what it is. I was comfortable in the streets. Got shot. Now I gotta get comfortable with just chilling. You know what I'm saying? Working, doing what I gotta do. Hypervigilance is under hyper arousal, which means that the nervous system is stuck in fight mode. So the person is always amped up. They're argumentative. They're um, easily triggered. Anything that someone says to them, they go from, you know, having a moment of calm to a moment of intense anger and rage. What other ways did it, did it change you? My attitude, definitely. My eating habits, my breathing, my anxiety, and mainly anger, though. Were you more angry after that? Yeah. Still working on it, but yeah. So those are just some of the symptoms of traumatic stress that we found among many of the young black men that we work with. And we have to engage in cognitive behavioral therapy to address that through our hospital violence intervention program services. Next slide. And so this is the three forms of violence that uh, compound and produce community trauma. And I just want to pay attention to structural violence because we often do not talk about and discuss structural violence in the ways that uh, uh, concentrated poverty, food deserts, um, all contribute to, to violence as well and, and contribute to lower life expectancies, which then also structural violence leads and contributes to interpersonal violence and community trauma. Next slide. So it wasn't until I became a researcher and doing my work in trauma centers in Maryland that I realized that even my own experiences with structural and interpersonal violence led to symptoms of traumatic stress and particularly a sense of fatalism that you, as, a, as a young black man growing up in Philadelphia that I wouldn't live to see past uh, the age of 21, even though I wasn't involved in a high-risk lifestyle. And so this is one of the young men from, um, from my project. This is Slim. Um, and here he says, the next generation is in a cycle now. The kids that are being born in my neighborhood, they're growing up to beefs that we started. They're traumatized right now. They don't know it though. I was once him, I was once her. I know what they're about to go through. So we also need to address the intergenerational trauma um, that young black men experience. Next slide. So in DC, this is just a stat of how many people were shot last year, 922 people were shot. There were 198 homicides. As of today, there are 119 homicides. And at the same time last year, there were 115. Next slide. And so what I would like you to take note of is the number of young black men or black males who are uh, victims of homicide, but also if you look at the female homicide victims, the change between 2019 and 2012, from 12 
victims of homicide to 29 in 2020, which is a 141% increase. And as you can see, the number of black women who were killed actually is greater than the number of white men and uh, Latino males. Next slide, please. And so this is also a critical issue which we need to focus on in terms of intersectionality the increase in young black women who are being killed, not necessarily just through domestic violence and interpersonal violence, but also being, uh, I mean, in intimate partner violence, but also being killed through in, uh, interpersonal violence. And what we're finding is that many more young women are coming into the trauma unit who have been injured as a result of being in, uh, engaged in high risk behaviors, as well as relationships with people who are also in high risk, uh, engaged in high risk lifestyles and engaged in those networks. And so last year in Baltimore, there were 48 black women and girls who, who were victims of homicide. And so um, I'll end on that note, but I also want to acknowledge that in terms of transgender women um, and, and transgender persons in 2020, 44 transgender persons were killed as a result of gun violence and in uh, 2021, we're up to 34 and every three out of four uh, transgender persons are killed through gun violence and the majority are transgender uh, black and brown women. Thank you. Thank you so much for closing us out in that manner. So today we've had a full discussion in a short time We've talked about framing, we've talked about narrative, we've talked about practice, we've talked about policy, uh, trauma, structural violence. I've been writing it all down here. Um, and then we've also been uh, pleased to have the perspective of Camden and obviously DC, living in DC. I appreciate that as well. So with that, I'm gonna ask the other panelists to come on screen so we can just talk about next steps before we delve into some of the questions that have been posed by the listeners. And a reminder to the listeners, we are tracking some of your questions that you're putting in the chat feature and trying to capture them to pose later. But if you could do us a favor and be sure that you're asking your questions for the panelists in the Q&A feature that will help us to ensure that we get to your question. So for starters, uh, as I mentioned, you all elevated different aspects of gun violence prevention. So where do we go from here? I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Degutis. If, if there's something that you didn't get to elevate in your opening remarks, what's something that you wanna convey to our public health listeners um, that we need to do differently or do more of? Um, I think there's I think there's a couple of things. First of all, I think we need to make people aware or help them to understand that this is not a problem of just one population subgroup or one population group, that this is an issue across the board, um, that we all have a responsibility for doing something about it. We all have some accountability and there's various ways that anybody can engage in it. But um, I think what we need to work on is eliminating some of the biases that people have about where gun violence occurs and who's involved in it. Because um, we just, you know, when you talk to someone, they'll say, oh, it's just the gangs or, oh, it doesn't happen in my neighborhood. Or, uh, you know, I, I don't know anybody who's been um, a victim of gun violence. And um, I, just, I just think we have to help them, help people understand that this is a problem that we all need to deal with and we all need to um, really push our um, politicians, our policymakers to do something to uh, actually not look at this as a law enforcement issue, but look at it as a public health issue and to look at what alternatives can be used to help people engage in their communities. Thank you for that. And as you were talking, some folks did uh, pepper in the chat and I just wanted to echo uh, what I took away as your sentiment, recognizing that there is inequities in how violence is distributed. And mm -hmm. your point is, is that although there are those differences, it's a collective issue that we all okay. should be addressing with urgency. Mm -hmm. And I'll just go in order of, of the speaker. So Dr. Spivak, anything else you wanna elevate based on what you shared or what you heard today? Yeah, um, three, three things. One is that we need to begin to better deal with how the news media is reporting violence and homicides, because I think many of the misperceptions in the public are a result of 
the uh, misframing of this issue by the news media. Um, and I think that's a huge problem that does a disservice to communities of color that makes people think that these mass shootings are the problem rather than the um, day-to-day -day violence that's occurring. Um, I think the second thing is that um, much of the discussion focuses on what we can do from a legislative and regulatory perspective. And while there's a role for that in terms of uh, closing loopholes and background checks and things like that, the real richness of the response to this problem is going to be investing in community level strategies that really tackle this issue um, in, a, in a more comprehensive way. Um, I think I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell, your thoughts or reflections? Sure. Um, you know, I just first say, like, um, you know, I work in Camden, but Camden's also my hometown. So I am a native of that city. I have, you know, been through and heard all of the things and perceptions that people have of that city and know of the, you know, actual violence and perceived violence that goes along with living in a place like Camden. Um, and, you know, it's also one of the reasons why um, I firmly believe in, you know, the arts and cultural work that, that we do and thinking about ways that not only outsiders can think differently about Camden, but also the people that live there. Um, you know, when I was growing up in Camden, it was a badge of honor to say that you were leaving Camden, right? And that's, that's the thing that you want to try to change. But in order to do that, you have to be creating something that's livable. You know, it starts with, you know, decreasing the rates of violence and education and all of those other things. But it's also with providing things that families want to do and have fun. Um, you know, lives and, you know, this is about the humanity, especially when we're talking about black and brown communities. Um, there's lots of focus on a lot of those um, things and all of the traumas but not as much focused on trying to bring back the fun. And, you know, you have to have some, that you remember the humanity of the people in these neighborhoods and incorporate that into whatever public policies and health policies and interventions you're trying to make that, you know, these are, you know, that these are humans that deserve respect and deserve joy. So let's bring back some joy to our neighborhoods. All for that. And I always say that it's, <laughs> it's 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 good to find pockets of joy, and I and I agree that I don't think we discuss that enough in the context of gun violence prevention. So thanks for elevating that, uh, Dr. Richardson. I'll have you close us out on any sort of next steps. Where do we go from here before we delve into the Q and A? I mean, there are a ton of next steps, but I would definitely say in terms of the investment and gun violence as a public health crisis. Um, I can definitely tell you as, a, as an advisory board member for the Maryland Violence Intervention and Prevention Fund, um, Governor Hogan um, recently vetoed the funding for those programs in Maryland. And so at a time when we have a gun violence epidemic, we have a lack of resources and investment in hospital violence intervention programs, cure violence intervention programs such as Safe Streets, and so I think it's, you know, where, where we have this American Rescue Plan, um, where there can be a significant investment in gun violence reduction strategies, we need to engage in that. We need to invest in those things. There are some states like California, which has CalVIP, New York, which has, uh, has their own um, uh, violence reduction built into the state budget. We need to have those federal dollars and state dollars across the board. And we need to have better evaluation of what these programs are doing, what works, what doesn't work. But that also requires people to be on the ground. We need, we need culturally competent researchers, right? And it, I think it's unfortunate that there are so many uh, amazing gun violence researchers that are black and brown that just get totally ignored in this work. And uh, I'd just like to give a shout out to my group, The Collective, which are which is led by uh, Shawnee Bugs at UC Davis, and I'm a member of that group, where there are a number of us gun violence researchers that are researchers of color that are concerned with these issues, 
But in terms of gun violence research, which we know hasn't been funded for almost 25 years, which was recently, you know, $25 million, which is a drop in the bucket compared to uh, the, how we address other public health crises, particularly the opioid crisis. I think we need there, we have a long way to go in terms of the public health investment in these issues. Thank you for that. And I think actually you provided a great segue into one of the first questions that came in talking about sort of the, the role at the st state and local public health and what's effective there. And I don't wanna say in contracts, but in, in what we're seeing sort of was touted as a, a, a through law enforcement and crime perspective, how do we really usher forward that public health perspective and recognize that we need to look at things upstream and how are some of those uh, state and local um, pieces are, are, are a critical part of the puzzle as, a folks, as opposed to looking at downstream when folks are arrested, et cetera. So anyone can take that question. Linda, I think you're muted. Um, sorry. I think one of the difficulties has been for a long time that public health in general has been very underfunded. So that um, if, if someone in the legislature or the governor's office doesn't see this as a priority or doesn't, you know, isn't interested in doing something about it, then no money is going to the health department. And sometimes when you talk to people working in various health departments, they'll tell you, well, I can't, I can't work on that. I can't say anything about it. I've been, you know, I've been told that we can't deal with that. Um, it's not up to us to work on it. And so some of it has been this, to some degree, a politicization of the whole issue of gun violence, as opposed to looking at addressing it as a health issue and looking at how to address it as a health issue. Um, and some of the, the funding issues that, you know, um, apply to getting the research done, you know, it's the, the there's also issues with funding um, evaluation of what works in the community and figuring out what are the programs that are really effective and getting the word out about what can be done in communities across the country to help decrease gun violence. You know, so, um, so I think it's, I think a lot of the health departments just don't even get involved. And, and I would say the other, there's another piece of it that um, health department, CDC has provided funding for health departments and provided funding for them to do work in injury. And um, they have been essentially prohibited from using that funding to do much about gun violence, um, if anything about gun violence. So that's been another sort of roadblock where you know they get told, well, you can't use the money for this. You can't use the money for gun violence. You have to use it for other things, you know, and. So even if it's a major problem in a specific area, people can't use the money for it. Thank you for that. Any other um, thoughts on that? Yeah. How, um, and, what, yeah. and while you're doing that, Howard, I have another question for you to think about. Uh, it's a, just to, so I don't forget, but to make note, note of your remarks about the increase of gun um, homicides in relation to gun compared to other forms of crime and violence. Well, I, I think just picking up on what Linda said, I think quite frankly that um, uh, the funding needs to come from the federal and state health departments, but local health departments have to own this issue and that's still a problem. And I think that's one of the things that, that local communities can begin to influence is to, is to really push their local health departments to in fact define violence and gun violence as a public health issue and get it on their radar because it's not on the radar of, radar of many uh, local health departments. I'm, I, um, I'm not sure what, your sec what the other question yeah, was. The other question, yeah, they just wanted you to clearly delineate that what you were saying was that while uh, other crimes, there was not an increase, there was certainly an increase in um, gun violence specifically. There, there was, there's been an increase in homicides. The large majority of that increase has been in firearm related homicides. There's also been an increase in non-fatal firearm injuries. So it's not just homicides, but it's gun violence in general. 
that has been substantially increasing over the last year and a half. Thank you. So we have a question, uh, lots and lots of questions. <laughs> so Miska, one of the questions for you is, is that recognizing that a lot of your work is in the arts and, and sort of uh, rehabbing spaces, public spaces, environmental interventions. Uh, is there any work that's being done around um, vandalism or uh, to prevent sort of graffiti or anything that ruins sort of the installation? Someone just, how do you protect them is what they're asking essentially. Sure. Um, well, I mean, two things. And one, I would say we've had this current installation, um, it's been up since April, and we've had one incidence of vandalism. Um, over all of the sites. Um, and so, and I think you, what you will find and you will hear other people say, and especially when you think about like murals and other things like that, that arts and cultural installations generally do have an impact on the community that does not lend itself to actually getting much fun as vandalism as one would expect to see in, in other places that you might see in even other parts in this, of the same neighborhood. So um, you know, people, especially when you involve them in the process of creation of those things and so that they feel that it's theirs, um, we actually haven't had many issues, although certainly we are prepared for them. We, we, we clean up, you know, graffiti when it happens, um, you know, that's part of the, the process of having those things out there. Um, but, but also, you know, when we're thinking about um, prevention of vandalism and actually just changing the culture for one of those things, especially like if I'm thinking about illegal dumping. Um, right now, you know, we're actually focusing more on the policy side when we're thinking about that. And so increasing penalties for illegal dumping so that it makes it less attractive for people to come and illegally dump in the city. Um, and we've been doing a survey in um, Camden, in particular, a resident survey about the kinds of things that they would like to see, um, you know, whether, you know, it's additional cameras or additional landscaping. And so it varies by some of the neighborhoods on some of the things that we see, but we try to make sure we are using a resident driven approach for whatever that means is to make sure that we're, we're doing those things. But, you know, vandalism is something that I think we're all dealing with. This is part of the blight and vacancy that happens. Um, but the arts and culture interventions actually help to change that dynamic. And when you, you know, create and beautify these spaces, um, you know, it helps to instill additional pride into the neighborhood. It helps to have people have something beautiful to look at that they'll take care of. Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, it's always a step in the right direction. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I like you. I think what you said it, it resonates with me. It's like really shifting the culture and changing sort of the connectedness and the cohesion within the community. Uh, uh, Dr. Richardson, a question came in for you, and I just I think it's probably a point of clarification that they're seeking when you mentioned sort of high risk lifestyle and high risk behaviors in the context of shooting victims. If you can unpack that a little bit for them. Yeah, so I, I want to make this clear, though, in terms of the risk factors. So one of them, I would definitely say, is substance abuse, right? So we see young men who are engaging in substance abuse behaviors, such as like smoking marijuana all day or using Percocets, right? Because pills is really popular. Taking pills is really popular among many of the young men that I work with. But I also want to put that in context in terms of trauma. Right, and that this may be a way of self-medicating their trauma, which has never been addressed. And it's not necessarily just related to the incidence of gun violence. I'm talking about intergenerational trauma. So this is trauma from birth until the time they've, they've been injured and after that. So there is no post, right? There's a continuum of trauma that is actually the result of structural violence. So when you think about someone that has been has lived in concentrated poverty and everything that we would that we're trying to address in Camden, all of those structural issues, these are the traumatic effects that people are dealing with. And then the other, the other point would be um, carrying a firearm. And so I, you know, you hear these narratives and coming down on young black men about why they're carrying a firearm, but let's put this into context. We have we have police departments in many urban areas which are engaging in the most abusive behaviors and practices in black communities against black men and women. 
And so for communities that have a lack of distrust in the police, the closure rate is low. And then we also have people who, we have millions of guns that have just been sold. Many of the people who are carrying guns right now didn't buy those guns because they have felony records. So we need to track how those guns actually make it into those neighborhoods. How does a kid get a brand new AR-15, a brand new 40 Glock, right? And so when people feel isolated and alone, and they live in a neighborhood where crime is rising and homicide rates are rising, yes, the next default would be to carry a gun. And in many instances, I don't blame those young men for carrying a gun, but the problem is, is that now you have gun crime units that are out there to catch people with guns, which bring more people into the criminal justice system. So it's cyclical. And then once you have a felony record, it's difficult to get an employment, right? So all of these things, are connected and interrelated. It's an ecosystem. And you can't just address one thing without addressing the next. And so I just want to put it in context when I say high risk, that those high risk behaviors are actually perpetuated by many structural issues that have gone unaddressed. Thank you. And I think that, Linda, Linda you're muted if you wanted to say something. Yeah, could I add something to sure. um, what he said about about the guns and about tracing them, because I think that's a big part of the issue, too, is that we don't have access to the data about where guns are sold or, um, you know, who sells a gun. So there was at the time that um, a little bit later than the issue, the um, Dickey Amendment uh, decreased funding for CDC as far as gun violence goes. There were tire, the Tyard Amendment restricted the access to the records that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms has on gun sales and on gun sellers. And at this point in time, it is those that information is still not available to researchers. It is only available on a one-by-one -one basis to police departments that have to specifically request the rec, you know, a record based on. Um, some identification of a specific weapon. So that's another problem. It, it, and it helps perpetuate, I think, the issue that you're talking about is that, you know, we can't find out where, where are people, who is selling, um, sometimes, you know, selling some of these weapons way more than they should be um, and violating some of the, you know, some of the laws of sales. And then they get to people who are at risk and you know, it just, it, it makes it just as bad as, uh, or worse than it could be if we could actually get some, uh, the action could be taken against the sellers as opposed to these people who are possessing a weapon. Mighty? Yeah, I think I'm frozen. Can you hear me? Mighty? Yeah, yeah can you yeah, hear me now? Hear you. Okay, great. Go for it, Howard. Yeah, I just want to add one other point to emphasize something that Dr. Richardson said, and that's the whole issue of early childhood traumas um, mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, we know that young children, when they experience various traumas, and it doesn't have to be violent traumas, it can be any number of things, are at much greater risk for involvement with violence, both as a victim or as an assailant. Um, as a pediatrician, I consider this enormously important. I took care of kids who literally never slept on the top of their beds. They slept under their beds mm -hmm. because they heard gunshots in their community at night. Um, uh, children who are, um, right. are uh, don't get enough food and um, um, kids who uh, for various reasons are traumatized in their school experiences, all of those things have implications in terms of later risk. And so part of this intersectional response needs to be to um, uh, yeah. be alert to kids and the traumas they experience, identify those kids and provide services for those kids before their problems escalate into far more serious situations. Thank you. So uh, I have some questions coming in and you already elevated this uh, uh, throughout the conversation today regarding shifting from shootings to more structure, how we focus on structural issues. And if we can, if the panelists can speak to that um, when we're talking about homicide, but suicide as well. So how do we shift from the incident to addressing the structural factors that contribute, contribute to both? 
and I'll leave it open and unless someone's chomping at the bit to, to answer. Um, wait, just can you just say that again? Just sure. So there are quite a few questions coming in and helping us to reframe in public health it, to move away from right. fo focusing on the incident, but thinking right. about sort of the structural factors that led to that incident, that both led suicide to and homicide. I think, yeah, and there's lots of ways, you know, that we have to, I think, um, in talking, you know, the, the community programs are certainly one of the primary kinds of structural um, kinds of uh, interventions that could work when you talk about making people able to enjoy their community or to do things that where they feel safe and, you know, um, so the, the ability to do that is a real, it's a structural issue uh, to some extent and ensuring that those kinds of programs are available in, you know, in communities where there are risks. But some of the other things really do have to do with, I think, as, um, as Howard said, the early childhood issues and really looking at what are we doing with very young children? How are we, how are we helping them to um, grow up in a, uh, without the sense that violence is the way that problems get solved, that issues get um, addressed, that, you know, if somebody has a disagreement, that violence is the answer, as opposed to some other ways of dealing with um, disagreements. So I think those are some of the structural pieces. And when you look at the ACEs that um, Howard was talking about, the adverse childhood experiences, um, there's a lot of those that really relate to structural changes that are needed. I, mean, I, I think that the, I, I was going to say, um, like, I think the conversation, the health conversation has been changing over the years as the word health has kind of been brought in and that people are thinking a little bit more holistically, but, you know, historically, and I think it's still very much the case that, you know, funding and organizationally, um, we are very much in silos and we tackle things in silos so that, you know, there's an organization working on, you know, food security and an organization who might be working on youth programs and another organization working on, you know, job placement, when all of those things factor into whether or not someone might be a, a, a victim of crime or be involved in a crime themselves. Um, and there's really not many of things that are sort of holistically looking at, at, at a person or a family. Um, mm -hmm. And then certainly mental health, um, especially in black and brown communities is something that is definitely left out of the conversation. And when we're talking about um, you know, traumas and early traumas, you know, being born black, right, is maybe a trauma in itself, right, when we're thinking about those things, and whether or not meant there's any mental health services being involved, those are generally not there and in the places. So, you know, certainly, I think, you know, making sure that all the conversations that we're having, like these webinars, and trying to broaden the conversation to say, you know, there's a lot more to talk about when we're talking about violence than just talking about the guns or just talking about one particular aspect. Like, you know, that's why arts and culture becomes a part of that same conversation, just like jobs are and just like food security is. That, you know, you have to be thinking differently about sort of the holistic person in the community in order to make sure we're, we're tackling these things. Mm -hmm. in, I think in many ways we're, we're getting into um, uh, the whole issue of social determinants of health and right. issues of economic opportunity, of educational opportunity, uh, mm -hmm. and um, these are directly related to ultimately risk for involvement in violence uh, mm -hmm. and experiencing violence. Yeah. Absolutely. And, that, and uh, I don't know if you all have had a chance to look through the chat, but you've <laughs> there's a lot of uh, chat happening. And uh, so you all have done done your due diligence and really sparking <laughs> a continual conversations around this issue. But Howard, that's a great segue. There's a bunch of uh, chat around social determinants of health and some questions around uh, sort of the epi of violence, right? We can look at a, a map and see where violence is concentrated in certain communities. So the question asks is, so why aren't resources appropriately uh, allocated to those sources of violence? So if anybody 
can speak to that, that would be great. Dr. Richardson, looks like you were about to speak. Yeah, I would just say, you know, we can map violence, but if you were to map any other chronic disease, you would find them in the same place. Right? I do this analysis all the time in, in Washington, D.C., and if I were to map the, the disproportionate number of COVID deaths, they would be in the same neighborhoods where gun violence was occurring. If I were to map diabetes, hypertension, any chronic disease, they would be in the same wards, right? So this is just another social determinant of health on top of another social determinant of health on top of another one. Right. And, it, and we need to take a much more holistic approach to not just looking at gun violence in a microcosm, but there are many other diseases that are lowering the life expectancy of people who live in those neighborhoods just as much as gun violence, if not more. And so uh, you, we mentioned mental health, but the reality is there are so few mental health clinicians. I re read a recent stat that there's one for every uh, 30,000 people, there's one mental health clinician. So in terms of accessibility, stigma, the cultural competence of mental health clinicians, all of those things are huge factors within communities, particularly communities of color and a lack of accessibility to mental health clinicians, mm -hmm. which is why we probably need to turn to much more of a, a, a telehealth approach, right? where we can provide accessibility to those telehealth services and people don't necessarily have to jump on a bus to get there. But then and that also brings in the question, do people have the digital means to do it, which is a digital divide problem. So I would definitely say that, yeah, we can, we can map all of these issues on top of each other and pull back the layers on each one of them. And there are public health issues across the board, just not gun violence, mm -hmm. but just a lack of investment in those communities to address these social determinants of health. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think the other, yeah, not on mute. One of the other pieces too is that when we have people who are um, going into the, you know, who are studying public health, who are, you know, being taught about the various aspects of public health, there's very little education about violence or in general, or gun violence, there's not a requirement that they learn about it, or that they learn about, you know, what they, they may learn about hypertension, about heart disease, about infectious disease, but they're really not um, being taught about some of the factors that are associated with violence. And I think that's another, you know, it's another um, huge gap that we have, that people aren't learning about that and seeing it and learning what they can do um, as far as, you know, as far as treating it as another public health problem, but also um, incorporating it as part of the overall picture of health. When you look at someone and say, what is their health like? You know, that the violence is just one, it's one other part um, of health. Thank you. So the next, I'm going to take a few questions that have come in and lump them sort of into one question. And it's really centered on partnerships. As you all have already elevated, gun violence is not singularly um, public health's responsibility to address, right? We have to partner and think creative, uh, creatively about addressing it truly. Uh, Mishka, you talked about sort of the arts and cultural piece of it. One of the questions came in for you about uh, any work that you're doing with law enforcement and sort of the rebranding of how it's playing out in Camden. So if you can speak to that and if others can speak to any other, I I'm trying to get away from the phrase of non-traditional partners, but any other unconventional partnerships that you've engaged in around this issue, that would be great to elevate as well. Thank you for that. Um, and certainly I think, you know, for anybody who might be following what's happening in Camden, Camden is a a bit of a unique case. Uh, the city of Camden completely disbanded its city-run police department in 2013 um, and reformed a county-run police department. Um, so it's the county, the Camden County Police Department Metro Division. Mm -hmm. um, it has since been, you know, in that in this sort of new format ever since then, um, with sort of a whole new. Um, set of officers, um, some from the previous department. Um, we did bring over the chief at the time, 
Um, but, you know, there's lots of new officers on the street. We went from, um, you know, I think we were able to double the police department um, through some efficiencies under the county department to get more officers on the street, um, move to a new community policing model. Um, we have a, a current police chief that is a native of the city of Camden. Um, you know, so I think, you know, things have really changed on the policing front and their ability to be out in community. So we actually partner a lot with our, uh, our, our Metro Police Department and actually in lots of our arts and culture initiatives. So because they do their own sort of community events and things like that, they're really sort of out in the community. And so they're our partner in our community movie nights. Um, they're there and present and giving out snacks and things like that. And so we um, you know, partner with them a lot on a lot of the work that we do, but we certainly, we, um, you know, our, our name is Camden Community Partnership for a reason, uh, because literally all of the work that we do is built around bringing other people to the table. Um, and so whether that's, uh, we partner with our uh, local hospitals, uh, one of them has a, a, a virtual a mobile market. And so when we do um, our afternoon concerts, the mobile market shows up so that they have access to fresh uh, fruit and vegetables there um, as a part of that initiative or whether or not, you know, we're um, partnering with some, you know, local schools or arts and, you know, theater groups or things like that. So sort of we really do expand our base and think differently um, it also helps, you know, we're thinking if any, you know, people are from the nonprofit world, organizational wise, when we're thinking about funding, um, because, you know, literally, um, you know, no matter what it is, you know, you can circle it back to some kind of place. And so whether we're thinking about health or environment or tradition, more traditional based arts and culture work, um, it's all part of the same sort of uh, ecosystem. And we're able to tap into those different types of activities um, de depending on what we're doing. So uh, I'm always of uh, the guys, the more the merrier, um, the more people at the table and trying to sort of build that collaborative structure um, in order to really make a difference in the community. I, I would add um, one thing that, that if you look at some of the successful models around the country, um, a cornerstone of these models has been high levels of community collaboration and coordination. And among other things, that requires staffing. And I think we need to begin to hold mayor's offices accountable for staffing and providing the platform for groups to come together and work together and coordinate their work. The other, I think, I think that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. And I think there's other pieces, like you talk about non-traditional partners. Um, some of the work that I've done has, I've been doing has been in suicide. And I know that um, starting several years ago in Colorado, there was work done with the gun store owners to help them to identify someone who might be purchasing a gun because they intended to use it to die by suicide. And they worked with them to give them, you know, information about what the, um, what the clues were to that. And they'd been very successful in working together with the gun store owners to help prevent those sales from occurring um, and get people some intervention. The other um, piece of it is I've been doing work with, um, uh, with the VA on suicide and veterans. And as many of us know, veterans are very good at um, shooting. It's part of their training and suicide is a big, problem in veteran populations. And so some of the work we've been doing has been to look at um, whether we can identify a trusted significant other or a trusted concerned other that a veteran who um, has had some issues with PTSD or um, might have some issues with depression would be willing to, would, would agree to allow that person to um, take their gun away during a time when they were in crisis or hold it, you know, and, and not give it back unless they, you know, unless they recover from this crisis. And we're seeing some um, very positive results. We don't have all of it um, put together yet, but, but we're trying to do that kind of work with veterans to see whether we can engage 
some of their family members a little bit more in helping to prevent suicide. So that's another, you know, it's just, a, it's a different context, but it's also a very important one. Absolutely. I, I would add, I would add two things. One that um, many more scientists engage in translational research. Mm -hmm. I think we're in the business of doing the work so it can literally translate into interventions right. and not necessarily the interventions that we're currently seeing right now. I think there's enough space for smaller community-based organizations which don't get nearly the funding that they deserve or have the infrastructure and technical assistance to carry out the work in ways that's evidence-based. Right. Right. And we throw that word around a lot. So, and just in terms of um, investing in more community-based organizations that are actually doing really good work, but they mm -hmm. cannot prove that what they're doing is effective. And that requires investment in the infrastructure, technical assistance, and also a researcher practitioner relationship. Where mm -hmm. we have researchers that are partnering with practitioners to get those, that work out that's innovative and effective, mm -hmm. but we need to prove that it works instead of going with the typical usual suspect of models that we have. And, and you know, I'm a victim to it as well as a, a former director of a hospital violence intervention program, mm -hmm. that there are far more other innovative approaches that are in the communities that people have their ideas about what works. They know it works, but we haven't been able to evaluate it. And we need to find ways to get into those communities and identify those people who are engaging in this work, but they're in a small 501c3 with less than three employees and they're operating on a shoestring budget. Thanks for that. You actually segued into one of my next questions. I was going to ask about some research gaps, and that's certainly a piece of that puzzle. But I'll come back to that as I'm seeing in the chat. There's a lot of um, interest in how survivors are engaged in this work. So if any of you can talk about work that you've done with survivors and how they're uh, leading some of the gun violence work forward, uh, any immediate thoughts or reflections? Howard, you, you're unmuted. Yeah. Oh, go. Oh. go. Go for it, Joseph. Yeah, I would say, uh, First, the, I, all of my projects are community-based uh, participatory research and, and having patients involved in, in terms of patient-centered outcomes research. So Life After the Gunshot Digital Storytelling Project, that one clip, it's actually 98 minutes and we, that's the first episode. We have three other episodes, but the young men that are engaged in that process were part of a patient-centered outcomes um, study. And one of the things that I would, in, in terms of young men that have been affected by gun violence and, and creating their own solutions, there were numerous solutions that the young men that I worked with created that I brought back to the hospital administration who didn't support those ideas. And so what you're finding is, is that people have their own solutions. They wanna see those solutions translated into effective interventions, but then you have to deal with the hierarchy and bureaucracy of those who actually control the intervention. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the problem. It's how do you take those voices and empower those young men to see though their solutions or proposed solutions actually translated into effective interventions. And I'll give you one example. So for one of the things that I learned through my focus groups is that young men who were engaged in this, I'm speaking for my hospital violence intervention programs at that time, I'm not speaking for anyone else. So don't take this as a generalizable statement. But the young men that I worked with suggested that they did not want to engage in services which were at the hospital because it was a re-traumatizing experience. And I kept hearing that narrative over and over and over again. Why do we need to engage in this process at the hospital when potentially we could do it on my college campus, right? Young men are exposed to a college environment. They're, they're engaged, they're learning about higher education. Many of them would ask me after they would engage in focus groups on my campus, how do they get into the University of Maryland? These are ideas that they're creating, right? But where is the political will to support that, right? And again, I think we, we get so caught up in the narratives of 
the typical programs and assuming we should fund these programs because they're shiny and new or they have political cachet, but there are other, there are other innovative approaches that we can use as well in terms of how we address it. And, and many of those solutions come from the young people that we work with. I, I would add that um, survivors are not just those who have been directly affected by gun violence, but parents and siblings of homicide victims as well. And one of the most effective advocacy groups in Boston, for example, were mothers of young men who had been murdered. Um, so I think engaging parents of homicide victims, siblings of homicide victims, is another strategy that's been used in a variety of communities. And these individuals become very powerful spokespeople for um, um, resources, for attention, um, and can be a, far more effective in approaching politicians than others may be. Thank you. Um, I see we're coming close to the time here, but we have, have a few more questions that I want to pose, and then the others will um, get answered in another manner. The, we have a few questions coming in around uh, violence in rural America, and if anyone can speak to sort of what's happening there in contrast or in context of what we're seeing in some of our cities, uh, whether we're talking about suicide or homicide. Can anyone speak to that? We're talking about both. I think that's that's the and one of the things we haven't said very much about um, in our conversation today has been about family violence and um, you know intimate partner violence, where and and some of those incidents um, do um, constitute some of the mass shooting incidents or some of the mass violence incidents. Um, so that's that's one thing that occurs in rural areas as well as urban areas, suburban areas. Um, it's not, you know, it's not unique to one particular area. Um, suicide is an issue as well in rural areas. And as are other, you know, other homicides. I mean, you know, not, not just the domestic violence, but someone using a firearm to settle a dispute. So... Um, it's, it's somewhat similar, but I think we don't, um, because of the smaller population or whatever, we don't, you know, we don't see it in quite the same way. And there are some different issues. It, it's just like there's, you know, when you talk about a community, not every community is going to respond the same way in the context of preventing violence or, you know, have the same response to various activities. But in rural communities, we still have a lot of the issues of um, that contribute, you know, that are the social determinants of health, of poverty. We have some where there's um, food insecurity as well. Um, there's a there's a county in Colorado that has no pharmacy, no primary care, no mental health. Um, it's a rural county, but you know, again, it's lacking the resources that people might need in order to um, take care of their health. So there's, there's rural communities all over the country that are having these same kinds of issues. Thank you. So the, the, we have questions coming into around, uh, so we there, we know what we know, right? And then there's what we don't know. Can we talk to, and uh, uh, Dr. Richardson, you started to lead us down this route a little bit earlier, but what what areas of research are still uh, de deficient? Where, where should we be turning next when it comes to research? Uh, any thoughts there? A million and one place. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, definitely, definitely the evaluation of what works and what doesn't work. Um, we haven't really done a great job, and I just want to shout out to um, one of my colleagues, Chris St. Ville, who's doing an RCT in D.C. on hospital violence intervention programs, but it's still mm -hmm. challenging because it, there is such a low end in mm -hmm. terms of getting people involved in randomized controlled trials. Um, I will be initiating an evaluation of Safe Streets uh, in the near future in Baltimore, but we still need more evaluation work there. Um, as, as was mentioned, 
um, ACEs and what ways that ACEs uh, left undiagnosed and untreated, you know, plays out in adulthood in terms of um, risk behaviors and trauma. Um, but also, yeah, I think the, the issues around uh, rural violence is, is critical. Um, the Javi, uh, I, probably I, within the near future, will be making an investment in terms of um, more hospital violence intervention programs that are in rural areas. So I definitely think that that's a place where we should focus on. But again, I, I, the larger issue which looms for me is the guns. How are the guns getting there, right? Where do the guns come from? And how can we trace how these guns make it into these in, into the urban communities? And we know the ATF hasn't done a really great job at it and we need to we need to really figure that out because mm -hmm. at the top of all this someone is to blame for how these guns are flooding into communities of color and why we have so many guns in this country so i think mm -hmm. that really is where we want to investigate but you know that's a, a political third rail for many people will that get funded i don't know <laughs> Got it. <laughs> well, I, we, we're almost out of time, but I want to give, is there any other thoughts before we wrap up on um, uh, maybe one immediate thought on where we need to go next when it comes to research? Research. I think, I think there's a, I, there is one thing and that is that, um, that I would just recommend looking at and seeing the relevance of it at this point, because I don't think the research has been done. And after the um, Sandy Hook killings, um, we were able to get the National Academy of Medicine to put together um, a, a report that talked about the research that's needed for public health approach to gun violence prevention. Um, and that report has a number of research questions and they're, they're really, it's, it's more applied as you, know, as you had recommended that you know, we really have to look at um, applied research. Um, but, there hasn't been the money to do it. So it's like, we can, we can come up with all kinds of research ideas, but if we don't have a way of supporting them and funding them, there's no way we're gonna be able to do them. If we don't have a way of finding um, funding to evaluate the programs that are implemented. And have the buy-in no for it, right? It. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Know? Yeah, and and I, I just want to underscore Dr. Richardson's point about, you know, making the connection between the practitioners and the researchers. Right. And, you know, like, you know, we're partnering right now with the University of Michigan, where they're mm -hmm. studying the impact of some of these illegal dumping interventions on community violence. But, you know, we don't really have that opportunity. And, and we have, you know, research institutions in our city that we haven't partnered with to do really any re research, right? So it's like, how do we make these connections between the research institutions and the communities? You know, cause they're studying things, but I don't know it's necessarily what we need studied in the community Absolutely. when it's related yeah. to that. So how do we make these connections? Yeah, well, Absolutely. It, it needs to be as the research informs practice, the practice has to inform the research otherwise, the researchers are asking questions that are of interest to them, but maybe not of interest to the communities that they're doing the research in. Even. Absolutely. So, yeah. Any closing thoughts from you, Howard, on research? Uh, well, we've we, yeah we've covered a lot of territory here. I think um, I just want to put a plug in um, that schools of public health in general need to get more involved in this issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, some schools are investing in this, and but mm -hmm. many of the schools of public health, as is true with many of the health departments, have not taken on or owned this as a public health issue, and that needs to change. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Totally agree. So uh, just a reminder to everyone, there will be a survey that's going to pop up at the conclusion of this webinar, so please be sure to uh, provide us with some feedback. We enjoy feedback. It helps us to ensure that we are meeting the needs of our public health folks and um, just ways to bring additional content to you all. Also, please don't forget that if you wanna get the book that was mentioned today, use GBP for the discount code through August 20th. And just a virtual round of applause for all of the panelists today. Thank you all for your insight your um, ways of 
getting us to think differently about the work we're doing and to usher us forward as we again think about this work with intention and accountability. I um, apologize for my video being off, but I had some Wi-Fi issues, but we made it through it. And uh, just look forward to our paths crossing again in the very near future as we all continue, continue to collectively work to address firearm violence. So thanks to you all panelists and thanks to everyone who tuned in today. Thanks. And that's all folks. Thank you, Mighty. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, my course. So thanks thank you, all. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be following up. I'm sure Yato and the interns will follow up via email as well.